Hello everyone, welcome to the first ever special operations tournament. This time we're doing a popper format and we had uh, this time around a 32 player double elimination round which started off yesterday. Today we're going to see the top six action as the top six popper players do get out for the win. Uh, on the line this time we've got some diamond and gold prizes. First place taking away 500 diamonds, 2,000 gold, 300 diamonds and 2,000 for the second place and 200 diamonds and 2,000 for the third. So there's some stuff on the line here. Um, a little bit different from a lot of the other uh, tournaments that we're doing but very interesting to see some completely different decks, totally different gameplay, totally different styles. We are for this popper tournament also doing a best of uh, one format so it's it's a little bit different everybody's bringing one game one deck playing the one game seeing how they do if you don't make it you've still got a chance in the losers bracket so it's been interesting to see how this totally completely different type of format uh, has played out now joining me today I have two uh, absolutely elite players in the cards community who are no strangers to tournaments, total titans of the tournament scene, who have been through so many of them, including the World Championship. It is, of course, uh, the world champion himself, uh, J King Seven, and the third place runner up, Berto Burrito. Thank you so much for joining me today, guys. Thank you very much for having us. Awesome, yeah. awesome to be here uh, with you guys. Um, so before we head into the games, how about we take a quick look at the bracket and see how things are? Here is our bracket. So, in the winner's bracket, we've got Vinny taking on Dr. Fattest. Uh, now, over on the lower end of the bracket, we've got the loser side of the bracket, where we've got um, Inquisition taking on Kraton, and then Herbal taking on Henshin Rider. Now, the way that we go through this, we're going to start off on the lower end of the bracket um, in the loser section. So we will start by seeing Sir Inquisition taking on Kraton. We will then move into Herbal versus Henshin Rider. The winners of those games will move on, and we will watch that game next. Then, move Moving into the winner's bracket, um, and whoever loses in the winner's bracket will then take on the um, previous winner from the losers until we get to the end. Now, of course, we have that one special game there um, at the end there marked with, uh, with a special little square. That is... Uh, a game that we might play, we might not see. It depends on how the final game uh, comes out. Uh, of course, this is a double elimination round, which means that every player needs to lose twice. Uh, so if the person uh, in the winner's bracket there um, keeps keeps winning and then loses um, again in the end, we'll play that extra round to see who is the real champion. Um, so tell me, guys, what are you excited to see to you today? Yeah, I'm very excited to see sort of the different uh, meta that evolves when you have different formats. So with Popper, it's not just um, slightly different decks and what cards you're forced to use, but it's what cards you can't use, what cards you no longer have to play around that might warp uh, the standard meta that we see. And I'm ready to see Britain Minor self damage take it home. <laughs> Let's go, <laughs> Britain. <laughs> Yeah, we're very excited to see these different decks, these totally different things. Of course, Jay King, thank you so much. You made for us uh, that awesome explainer video uh, where you put together your own kind of little take on the popper deck. Now, we're not really seeing that deck in this tournament. We're seeing a, a little bit of similar stuff. We're seeing definitely some cards that you highlighted, um, but it'll be interesting to see, uh, to see how this shapes up. And uh, of course, you guys are going to cast us through all the action today. Are you guys ready for this first matchup between Inquisition and Kraton? Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to see. I'm not familiar with either of these two players, but they both have great names. Um, and who knows, maybe we'll be seeing them again in the future. Absolutely, and that's the awesome thing about doing a, a slightly different format like this. It, it offers some new faces to get in there, and who knows, maybe three months down the line, one of these guys is going to be uh, duking it out with you guys on an OCC. Who knows? Let's see. Let's find out. <laughs> but with that, how about we head into the first game? First off, we're going to take a look at the deck lists of both Sir Inquisition and Kraton. If you would take us through those, please, guys. Yeah, yeah. of course. Uh, we see Sir Inquisition has a US-German sort of mid-range style deck, and this is a deck that we see uh, quite a few variations 
of them in the top six. Um, yeah, well, sorry, what were you going to say, Brodo? What do you think about the Blitzkriegs when it's so often going to be uh, mid-range control mirrors? Do you think those are going to be hard to get off in this kind of format, unless you've sort of already won? With the power of Second California, I think it's possible we could see Blitzkrieg just ending games very quickly for the player that can stick a second California in the front line for even just a turn, and then you use cards like the M8 Greyhound, the Panzer 35G, to put in these Blitz tanks, get off the Blitzkrieg with the California. But that is if you can hold it. You are right that if you can't hold the front line, if it's in contention, it's going back and forth, your Kali's are being retreated by cards like Half Track, um, or they're just trading out with other units, then these Blitzkriegs can be dead cards that just sit in your hand. Yeah, I think we'll see a lot of wrestling for control desperately for that front line because it's your source of draw with the M4 Shermans and your source of lethal damage with Blitzkrieg. So people will be really desperate to keep that front line clear for their, from their opponents. And a couple unique cards about Sir Inquisition is these three copies of Patrol and two copies of the uh, T19 Howitzer. Uh, so it's a little bit lower on the curve. He's only running two second Californias. Uh, do you think this is going to help him um, by getting units out quicker, dealing with the board quicker and these artilleries in the sport line, or do you think he's going to lack the value? Well, I do really like the howitzer, if he's able to keep it alive. Um, the patrols, I'm not sure so much what sort of uh, destruction effects or smokescreen that will be able to trigger in this tournament. So it seems like 2k for 2 damage, which I'm not sure is quite efficient enough, but we'll see. It will be interesting indeed, and let's take a look at Kraten's deck list now. I know you're very excited to talk about this one, Berta. <laughs> <laughs> I am. So I had a theory that I thought self-damage would be quite good in this tournament. It loses out on more cards than US midrange does. And so if you were to take a self-damage deck to ladder and it was popper, it would perform worse than the US Germany deck it, by a pretty wide margin. But it is a very powerful deck into US midrange. So I I have faith in it. <laughs> uh, even with the 7k 34th guards, uh, Kraten going for a very interesting strategy, going for Britain Miner, which gives him access to draw that self-damage lacks with Japan Miner, because all of their draw is in the form of the recons and the scouting parties, which are of course both specials. So now he has access to things like Convoy and Lendlease, and the very interesting cards are things like Naval Power and Supply Drop which is not something I would have considered, but maybe the naval powers will help keep him alive if he has a bit of a slower start to get that front line back, not die to a Blitzkrieg too early, and then get out his huge threats very efficiently with the 34th guards. I am a huge fan of the supply drop. Uh, it can be a little weak to half track, but when you're playing down these humongous infantries, like these uh, 34th guards, the 17th rifle regiment, giving up just plus four defense and guard. If your opponent does not have a half track or in the case of his current opponent patrols, um, that can just immediately win the game. I know the last time there was a proper tournament was several expansions ago, but uh, 17th rifle regiment plus supply drop was the winning combo um, because you just get this unit that's constantly repairing itself to full and it has a guard. Your opponent just can't break through, but there's, we see more resources in, um, or Inquisition's deck that could potentially answer this, so we'll have to see. Thank you so much for that, guys, for breaking down these decks. Um, looking at these two decks, I, I know that uh, Birdo certainly has a has a big soft spot for uh, for Soviet. Um, what what do you think, J King? Who do you think is gonna gonna have this one? Um, I think I'll I'll put my money on Sir Inquisition. Uh, well, I do think self damage is quite strong into US mid range. Uh, I'm not convinced it's going to be able to deal with the more um, tempo-oriented cards in uh, US midrange, like the half-tracks, like these dive bombings. Um, I think he might just get dominated off the board. 
Absolutely, absolutely. It's going to be very interesting to see. And of course, Sir Inquisition and Kraton, new players that we haven't seen today. Let's kick it off here, guys. Take us through all the action of this game. All right, so we see the opening mulligan. Um, Kraton not having any self-damage other than this Winter Warfare. Not really what you want, but 234th. So if he does send back, maybe get a sickle, maybe get some red dons, uh, this could be the start of something very good. Uh, on Inquisition side, he's actually keeping the patrol. That's very interesting. Um, can you think of any units in particular he might be trying to target with this patrol? I am really not so sure. It's hard to think of what in the early game would it would really hit. And now, this is an important decision for Kraton. If he wants to get out the sickle early to reduce the cost of the 30 fourths, or if he wants to take it a little slower to try to get more value getting the 456 online first, but he just goes for the sickle right away. And from his perspective, I think that's the smart play, because we see Sir Inquisition's hand, there's no 35T. Um, but if he does try to greed out try to go for this Winter Warfare to take out more 30 seconds, maybe he get the 456 out onto the board. He does just risk 35T going up, hitting face, but he takes out the 30 seconds, so Sir Inquisition moves up the Greyhound instead. And now Creighton can just remove it with uh, Red Dawn. He can play out the 456, or in this case, he just chooses to pass. Yep, going for a little more value here, which looks like it'll be quite handsomely rewarded with... Uh... Sir Inquisition going for these 30 seconds. Not going for the third 30 second, but just opting to deal one damage to face, maybe to play around Winter Warfare a little bit better. And looking at Sir Inquisition's hand, he has all three of his patrols, which is definitely not what you want in general, and definitely not what you want in this particular matchup. Um, do you think Raiden's going to go for the Red Dawn or the Winter Warfare? I would probably urge the uh, Red Dawn myself. Um, because these 30 seconds slower moving infantry, he does not have enough credits for we can do it yet. You can always play Winter Warfare on the next turn, but... Um... Yes, I think we can do it is the main consideration here. And because Sir Inquisition does not have access to it, I think Red Dawn makes a lot of sense. Sir Inquisition is not going to have to worry about the guards from this uh, <laughs> <laughs> 456 and the supply drop. However, getting rid of guards only really matters if he's going to have the front line to play with in the first place. And he does decide to go for the Winter Warfare after all. Uh, this does leave the Greyhound in the front line, which means it can trade off the uh, 456 with the patrol. And I suspect that is what we will see Sir Inquisition do. Um, his other option would be to move up a First Marines, of course. Yeah, I don't mind moving up a first Marines just because you're kind of in a bit of a desperate situation and you have to hope that Kraton doesn't have too many more answers in these sickles and these winter warfares and red dons. Off yeah. for the safer play. And from Sir Inquisition's hand, this game is not looking great so far. But looking at Kraton's hand as well, um, this is looking like just an amazing position for him with these two 34ths in his hand. And it looks like he's going to get both of them out by red donning this 32nd. I really like this. Valuing the tempo play, even if you're using one card a little inefficiently, red donning the 32nd, it puts you in a much stronger position for these coming turns. And that's very unfortunate for Sir Inquisition, drawing the Sherman just one turn too late. And he can slow down one of these 34ths with First Marines, uh, but he can't slow them both down. All right, and a 6-6 six, six in the front line is really hard to deal with for US mid-range. But Kraton's hand not having a lot of tools that are too relevant right at the moment. Yeah, if Sir Inquisition can draw into a second California, um, dive bombing would not be bad either in this situation, then he certainly could come back because these two naval powers, um, the counteroffensive and the supply drop, are pretty f okay, but uh, not amazing. Um, but yeah, no card draw, no additional units. If Sir Inquisition can find a way to deal with these two 34ths, um, this game is back into uh, anyone's territory to win. 
who 34ths, of course, not being an easy thing to deal with, <laughs> and the half track also coming just one turn too late to really impact the board. You don't exactly want to send the 6 breed back if your opponent's just going to use more self damage and get it back down as a 6 6 for cheap. Yeah. Um, here, I, I would be surprised if he does anything other than retreat this 6-6 uh, six, six out of the front line, just limit the amount of damage your opponent can put out. And you're actually setting up to be able to trade off both 30 fourths um, by just trading off the first Marines and the half track and using both patrols on the following turn. But that will leave you uh, nearly empty handed. And that is assuming Kraton does not have any way to buff the health of either of these units. Or remove some of the damage on the board in the half track or the first marines. And you have to be expecting that Kraton has some ways to do that if he passed with three credits up the last turn. And that's exactly the line he goes for. Um, but as we see, Kraton has his choice of removal or pin or health buff. Or really, all three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'd expect to see a Sickle on the first Marines, and then the Red Dawn to get the most damage possible off board, and then probably a Supply Drop. On the other hand, he could Red Dawn the Half Track, uh, and then use Naval Power to just pin the first Marines. Um, I, I would like to see the Supply Drop come out, just to protect uh, the 6-3 from an attack from a second California. Choosing to buff the 6-3, uh, I think this is a pretty good decision, spreading the health out um, on the two units. Yes, I believe so. And I actually think that you're right with this uh, naval power and this red dawn. It's hard to see a line for Sir Inquisition to really get through that. Well, it's hard to see a line how he gets through <laughs> the play here. <laughs> yeah. he times out. So he goes for sickle and naval power both on the first marines. Um, I mean, I think almost any combination of his cards there um, <laughs> would put him in this position, regardless, because looking at Sir Inquisition's hand, two showmans and two patrols does not handle this board. No, not at all. And this is the weakness of frontline. You need to have the frontline. And if you don't, <laughs> then you're, a lot of your cards do very little. And when we were looking at the deck list, we were talking about sort of the lower value of this deck with the three copies of Patrols in Inferior, unfortunately, for Sir Inquisition. That's exactly what they found, is all three Patrols, and no second Californias, no fifth Rangers, um, none of these large units that can try to answer these 34ths. Uh, unfortunately, it seems he has forgotten that there is a guard given by the supply drop on the 6-7. Um, despite the guard in the name, you're not used to these units having guard. <laughs> oh, you're not. And he sets up the counteroffensive. And this and is one damage short. And it, I, there's no card in Sir Inquisition's deck that he could possibly draw that will remove both of these units on the following turn. Um... And Crichton still has the choice of remove or just pin this first rifles. Or, not first rifles. <laughs> <laughs> first marines. Goes for the naval power, and... Fifth rangers, again, coming just a little too late. Not a lot he can do here. He can remove the 12-5, and... I mean, if you just no. look at the state of the board... He can only remove the 6-5, that's the one with the guard. Oh, <laughs> that's true. I've also forgotten which one has guard. And yeah, if he just had a little bit more health, um, he'd be in a fine position, a position where he could do a decent number of cards to draw his way out, but he does not have a lot of health. He has one health, and now he has minus 11 health, with Creighton taking that game. Yeah, he needs a little more health. He's taking 11 <laughs> over lethal damage. What do you mean a little? <laughs> needs a lot more health. And unfortunately, that's not what he has. <laughs> what a great game to start it off with uh, here. The Soviet deck showing its superiority here. Um, and 
as we are of course doing just the the best of one uh this is it for uh, for sir inquisition he is in the loser bracket already this is a second loss so he will not be moving forward but creighton will be moving on um and facing whoever wins our second game from the loser bracket here today uh next up we're gonna be taking a look at herbal and Henshin Ryder. Herbal, of course, someone that we do know a little bit from the tournament scene, someone who, who has been around, but uh, but perhaps taken a bit of a hiatus. Um, but he is someone that uh, that I heard made sure to participate um, in all of these kind of special rule events uh, that we had back in the day. And of course, what a better time to come back to the tournament scene than in one of these special uh, rule events. And we're so happy to, to have him back. He's gonna be facing off against Henshin Ryder, someone that we um, are seeing here for the first time. Let's take a look at their deck lists that we were bringing into this matchup. So here we see Henshin Rider's deck, and this is a deck that um, I'm actually slightly familiar with because yesterday um, I played against Airbull playing this deck on ladder. Um, he was playing this deck trying to get inside uh, the mind of his opponent, and I was playing the meta feigned retreat list. And I lost. This deck beat Meta Feigned Retreat, um, despite being a pauper version of Jaguar. This deck has a lot of potential. Um, it, a lot of damage can come out of seemingly nowhere, whether it's from the board with these SDs, the Type 93s, of course, the Blitz tanks, the 35Ts we're all familiar with, or from hand with Air Blitz and this 10.5-centimeter uh, artillery that deals two damage on deployment. Yeah, there's a lot more burn in this list compared to Feigned. And you also, the draw in expansion is really efficient. Some people complain about the power level of Convoy to draw two cards for three, but expansion can draw it for one. And if you are getting those off, then you can absolutely have an unreal amount of card advantage very early into the game which can really propel you to victory. You only need to get a few hits in with these infantry for your air blitzes, for your <laughs> 10.5 centimeters LEFHs, and your Mitos to take the game home, even if you never control the front line again after turn three. And you mentioned the, the need to control the front line for this expansion to draw. Um, if looking at this, we see Henshin Rider has 12 one-cost units, um, and as we'll see with Airbull's list in a second here, he only has four. That means Henshin Rider has eight additional one-cost units to um, Airbull, which means he's going to be hitting these more consistently. Um, he'll almost certainly have one on turn one, if not two additional ones on turn two. Um, and a lot of these have zero operation, so... Henshin Raidu, very good chance that he is going to be taking and holding this front line, at least in the beginning of the game. Um, so, he's going to need to try to exploit that, get as much damage in as possible uh, to get the victory. Speaking of, let's take a look at Airbull's list. And we have three out of the six decks in this top six being this US-German midrange. Airbull taking it in a little bit of a different direction, doing the German-US midrange. And being the German main, it gives him a more access to these German cards with these three cost, or sorry, three of FWs, uh, the Panzer IV, three copies of Case Yellow. Um, this is a card that we've seen um, throughout this tournament being popular. Um, however, it means he is limited on the US cards, and the key one here is only a single copy of We Can Do It being the only healing in the deck. So the most health he can have this whole game is 23. And I don't think we're going to ever see him break above 20, even if he plays <laughs> that, we can do it. But one thing I'm noticing is that you lied to me, J-King7. He has f eight one-drops in the deck. He's also running the 30 seconds along with the Panzer II oh, Cs. This is true. That is a complete lie. I had not looked at the US uh, side of the deck. He is running eight one-cost units, and these 30 seconds are going to be quite strong in contesting the front line. Yeah, that's going to give a lot more early game options. Go ahead, Ethan. 
Very interesting. Yeah, a couple of different decks here. And so nice, uh, so interesting of you to point it out, Jaking, that Henshin Riders deck uh, is 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 uh, is quite the quite the beast. It really goes to show that you can create a lot even if you don't have all the elites. Like there is a lot lot of value that you can get out of these uh, standard uh, and limited uh, rarity cards. So it will be really interesting to see the results of this. Any predictions for this matchup, guys? I mean. I'm, I'm going to go with Henshin Rider. I think that list is quite terrifying, um, and I think it might have the advantage just in this matchup. Well, we're about to find out as we head into this second matchup in the Special Operations Tournament. Take it away, guys. All right, we've seen the opening mulligan, um, and Henshin Rider sends back his entire hand, and he gets back just the Sakura Regiment for the early game, but um, that is going to allow him to play a turn two expansion if he wants. On Airbull's side, he's Keeping Tactical Strike and Fifth Rangers alongside the 32nd, probably not wanting to get two 30 seconds in his opening hand, and Fifth Rangers with zero operation cost, pretty strong card. Yeah, when you plan on keeping 32nd in your opening hand, you're always a little more willing to keep the cards you would normally send back, because if you find another 32nd there, you'll be pretty upset about it. <laughs> And Airball already being presented with a very interesting choice on turn two. Does he play the dive bombing? Does he play out two thirty seconds? He goes straight for the dive bombing. He wants uh, to just remove the control of the front line. And here, Henshin Rider, difficult to be playing um, sort of on curve in a way that he wants to. It's turn three, and his deck is already slowing down a bit. Yeah, and it's really scary to go for the faster play for Yamagata and the SD KFZ because Airbull has Panzer 35Ts in his deck, as you can see in his hand. And if he gets the value trade on the KFZ, then that would be a really massive issue. Yeah, and we see um, that Airbull did have the 35T in hand, so had Henshin Rider gone for that play, he actually would have been punished. So uh, very good on him for not doing that. But again, here he's presented another awkward situation. Um, he can use the 35T, trade off the opponent's 35T, and then play the KFZ with control of the front line. Um, do you see any other options he could go for here? You can just play the Yamagata and move up, but they're both really quite awkward. Just not quite making use fully out of your credits the way you want to, or sometimes with the Mita Regiment play on turn 3, not exactly taking advantage of the Blitz in your units, which makes them feel a little more inefficient. And here, Henshin Rider has three copies of this artillery. Um, I'd actually like him to not play the artillery here. I'd prefer to see him get in the attack damage with these units now. Uh, he does go for the artillery, and this is fine, because it is going to force the Trop to trade off into the support line, which means this SD is going to stick around, probably. Or Tactical Strike. And then Airbull has a very interesting decision here. Do you trade with the Mito? Or do you say, I have so much pressure, actually, that I can hit you in the HQ? <laughs> and try yeah. to raise. And with the We Can Do It, um, in his hand, the Blitzkrieg in his hand, Airbull is actually able to end out this game very quickly, and it will not matter how much damage Airbull takes if he ends the game um, over one health. Uh, <laughs> so if Henshin Rider puts all of these cards and all of his efforts into dealing damage to Airbull's HQ, um, then it, it still doesn't matter enough, unless he can get across that finish line. Um, and if he focuses too much on the HQ, he might just give Airbull the setup for this, um, like, 10, 15 damage Blitzkrieg to just end out the game. And in Airbull's rush to be trading off with uh, these units and these artillery, his trop is already down to a 6-2, and if it trades with one more thing, then it's going to be off the board for him. Henshin Rider going for the weaker units to get on board, but crucially both being Japanese units that can threaten to take the front line for this expansion sitting in his hand. Yeah, and that's definitely what he had in mind, is a unit 
uh, getting a unit to draw off of this expansion, and this California is going to limit it unless he can win the Akita hit into the California that will give him the ability to draw. And unfortunately, it hits the probably the worst um, option on the board, hitting this 38T. Yeah, if you hit the trough, you're pretty happy. If you kill the California, you're very happy. If you hit the face, maybe you can find a little more damage, but... And this is actually just one off lethal for Airball with push-up, Blitzkrieg, attack face with trop. So instead he goes for the we can do it, um, and I think this game is just in the bag. There is nothing Henshin Rider can do. Um, Airball can trade off the units, he can go all face, it doesn't matter. Um, this game is over, Henshin Rider got close, but um, unfortunately not close enough. He dealt 15 damage by turn 9 with control of the front line for very little of the game. Um, which is impressive in its own right, but this Blitzkrieg and the power of this Trop on turn 4 will end out the game in favor of Airball. If only he top decked a Sendai. <laughs> right, James? <laughs> <laughs> if only. But unfortunately, Sendai not in the format. That is one of the drawbacks um, that is hits the Jagro deck with this proper format, is you can't play cards like Sendai. Um, and you can't play cards like Feigned Retreat to more easily find these Type 94s for the surprise attacks. Absolutely. So we're seeing a little bit of the, the limitation as well. Sure, there's a lot you can do, but you can't do everything when, you, when you're limited to, uh, to just the standard and, and uh, limited uh, rarity cards in, in your deck. But amazing performance from Airball. He, uh, he, he had things locked down there pretty quickly and, uh, and was able to just sweep in for the win. And of course, again, just a reminder, this is a, a best of one uh, double elimination. We are in the loser's bracket at the moment, which means that Hench Rider is eliminated, so we have our top four um, players decided. All of these players are going to take home some diamonds, some gold. Let's take a quick look at the bracket here to see what that means. So we still in the winner's bracket, of course, have Vinny and Dr. Fattest, um, who will wait just a little bit longer uh, until we get to see those games. Uh, the first two games, Inquisition and Kraton, Kraton walked away there with the win between Herbal and Henshin Rider. Herbal was victorious, which means that the next game we will be viewing there in the loser's bracket is going to be Kraton versus Herbal. So that'll be, a, that'll be an interesting one to see. Now, we've already taken a look at uh, these guys' deck lists quickly, but how about we take just a quick look again, just to remind ourselves what are Kraton and Herbal going to be bringing um, and let you guys uh, kind of visualize how these how these decks are going to go against one another. So I think we're going to see a little bit of a different side of what Airball's decks can do in this game by being able to get to those Case Yellows, those Panzer IV, and those FW turns, which have a lot of value to go against the Soviet deck. Yeah, I think um, I think Airball's deck is slightly better suited for this matchup um, than we saw Doctor Inquisitions was because he does have one more copy of California. He has these FWs, the Trop, the Panzer IV, just these larger units to just contest the pure stats of 34th Guards. Uh, Tactical Strike is going to be another good option for taking out SUs or buffed up um, 456th in the support line. And there's fewer um, dead cards in the same way Patrol sort of just sat around in the hand for Doctor Inquisition. And if we go to the next deck from Kraton. Now, Airball, you might have been able to stop the aggression of the Japanese aggro, but can you face the might of the Soviet Union? We have uh, a lot of big threats that can come on very quickly. And I don't think Airball really has the option to limit how much he can get on the board to avoid these 34th guards coming out early. It's just not really what any of these decks do, and it's really hard to build a less unit-oriented control deck in this format. So I certainly can't blame anyone for that. Um, and these, this draw in the three convoys and the one Lundlis might be able to get him out of uh, some scary situations with the discard that Airpole is running in those case yellows. 
This is true. Uh, unless the situation that we have all experienced of Case Yellow hitting the one copy of Lendlease in your seven card hand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have certainly seen that before. It's it's all gonna come down to uh, to the to to those little random elements that you just can't quite uh, count on here. Of course, Herbal also has some tournament experience, so maybe he's coming into this with a little bit of like that extra confidence that you get. But it'll be really interesting to see how this uh, how this matchup ends up going. Yeah, um, I at this point it's starting to develop into a curse. The two players who I've uh, said I thought was going to win have both lost quite convincingly. However. Um, I do think Airwolf is going to take this. I think with his tournament experience and this slightly heavier list, um, I think it can deal with the power of Soviet self-damage. So I'm putting my money on Airwolf. Everybody knows where I'm putting my money. <laughs> <laughs> I love self-damage, and uh, I my heart belongs to Kraton. He, he's he's going to get it. It's going to go all the way. Trust <laughs> Amazing. Well, I'm 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 all here for it. Let's let's find out which one of you is right. It's uh <laughs> it's um it's not only the battle between Kraton and Erbol, it's also the prediction battle between good friends uh and world championship players, Jake <laughs> Seven and Perno Burrito. Amazing. Uh I believe we are just getting our players ready to head into the game here. Um of course, we we uh, we know your predictions here. Now we already have um, we already know who is in the winners bracket. That is Vinny versus Doctor Fattest. Now, whoever wins from this game is the one who's going to move into the finals of the loser bracket. So one of those players um, is going to make their way back into the winners bracket, and then we're going to have to go up into the winners bracket and see what the results are uh, from that one. Um, and of course, um, this is double elimination. This is just best of one. So, um, so, so you don't have a ton of chances. We're not gonna, we're not gonna be playing these games kind of over and over to see. Uh, yeah, you know, pe people, pe everyone has two chances, but uh, but that is where we end up. And and here we go. We are into game three. And Kratten this Kraton's hand here. With the two Sickles, Sickles is a very powerful card um, in this matchup, but you'd want them to be buffing your 456. You want them to be reducing the cost of these 34ths. Um, and he does not have any units currently in hand. Yeah, Whereas... it can be very difficult going first, finding all the pieces to the puzzle that you're looking for for self-damage. And unfortunately, he doesn't really find it. And based on Airbolt's hand, it looked like he kept the Tactical Strike, the Trop, and the Fifth Rangers. I'm curious, I believe Airbolt can go for a much slower strategy where he essentially passes the first three or so turns of the game. Because um, he does not need to fight for the early board. All, anything he plays in the early game will just be immediately removed. He can just afford to pass, pass, pass. However, we see he's going to go for the 35T uh, just on its own, which will dry out some of this removal from Kraton's hand, but as we see, there's nothing to benefit from this removal being played. Oh, and... an incredible draw. The 34th off the sickle, smartly doing sickle first, so that costs three instead of five. And that could really be the turning point in this match. It is difficult to understate how huge that draw was. This hand went from entirely orders with little to no impact to having a 6-6 six, six he can play on turn 4. And Airbolt's hand, he's going to be able to play a lot of stats. He has these two Californias, the Panzer F, but these are coming in the future. The 6-6 six, six is coming right now, um, and it has the supply drop, and it has, crucially, Winter Warfare and Counter Offensive. This unit has the potential to get very, very big. Yeah, I think if Kratten is winning this game, he's winning it fast. If he the naval powers, the supply drops, the winter warfare, they don't give much value, and Airbull's hand is full of value. So you really need to close it out quickly. But with the counter offensive, it looks like Kratten's in a pretty good position to do so. 
And that was a very difficult decision for Kraton, whether to move up the infantry or just pin this tank to keep your infantry alive. And we see Airwolf sort of has punishes for both plays. Here he can trade off the infantry with his tank, of course, and likely play tactical strike. He can just do fifth rangers to trade off the infantry. But if the infantry was not moved up, um, he could do a 4-4 four, four fifth rangers to the front line. And Airwolf choosing to do an 8-8 eight, eight fifth rangers in the support line. And this is going to get punished by naval power. Absolutely. You can just move up the 6-6 six, six naval power, the 6-6, the six, six, and pin this 8-8. Eight, eight. I don't like Bloody Sickle here. I don't think you need to play it, and I think that credit is better used attacking the HQ. Unless he's going for the supply drop, he will still have the credits to do both. I like the supply drop because it does keep your units alive, keeps the units on board for the power of this counteroffensive on the following turn. Yes, absolutely. And prevents this trade of the 2-2 two -two into your 2-2. Two -two. And this could just be game next turn. There's 8 damage on the board, plus counter Winter Warfare counteroffensive is an additional 9 damage. That is 17 damage that Kraton is able to do next turn from his hand. Yeah, and Airball is likely just going to try to get as much stats on board to try and contest this with the Trop and the Panzer to buff its attack. And that's two more units to... If he plays the Panzer, it's just game over. There is 19 damage in Kraton's hand right now. Panzer ends the game. Yeah, Airball can trade off if he wants to play around counteroffensive, but I don't even know if he should. Because if... How can you afford to play around Winter Warfare counteroffensive here? I think I think I'll go for the trade because it allows Trop plus Tactical Strike to kill this 34th, even if the 5th Rangers gets pinned. But he goes for the tank instead, and this is just game over if Kraton sees this. And if you're Kraton, I, I'm, I feel like you have to see this because it's the only way you can win in your hand. Your hand otherwise just does not do enough. And he plays the Winter Warfare... Surely that means he knows. You don't I'm, play Winter he, Warfare and then count. <laughs> he's triple checking the math. Counter offensive. And that is an 18, 15, 34th guards with a guard. And that just ends the game immediately on turn six. And the curse continues. I am sorry, Airball. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What a game. That, that really showing off the power of the Soviet uh, self-damage deck. I can understand why you like it so much, Berto. Uh, <laughs> that was amazing. That was that was amazing. Unfortunately, ending Herbal's run in this tournament today, but he had an awesome performance up until this point. Um, and I hope he had a ton of fun doing this alternate format, returning to the tournament scene. Hopefully we'll see him more uh, coming up. But with that, we have the uh, Kraton is going to be uh, duking it out against whoever loses this next game to see who makes their way out of the loser's bracket. Now, can we bring up the bracket and have a look at where we're at? Um, next up, we are going to be watching Vinny and Dr. Fattest uh, taking, uh, <laughs> duking it out to see who, which, which one of these guys is going to move on into the next um, round of the winner's bracket. And of course, the loser of this game is going to be fighting against Kraton to try and make their way out uh, of the loser's bracket. Um, really awesome performances from the guys so far today i was really i have to admit, i was not expecting this last game to go so fast but you know you you guys said it you know if if Kraton's gonna take it it's gonna be fast and it was it was fast and very powerful um but with that we are going to be jumping back into the winner's bracket we're going to be seeing Vinny, someone that we've certainly seen quite a few times in tournaments uh before someone who's uh, very accustomed to how these things go um and he's going to be taking on dr fattest before we head into the matchup though let's take a look at their decks because we have not seen these uh so far today
So, uh, we see Vinny's deck. It is a U.S.-German midrange, and as we'll see from Dr. Faddis in a second, it's also a U.S.-German midrange. This is going to be a U.S.-German midrange mirror, but there is some massive card differences here. Um, so, in, we see in Vinny's deck, he has three copies of the new Case Yellow card, which is very interesting. He has four copies of Second California. This is a much slower deck. This is a deck designed to uh, just reap as much value as it can. And it can also really hold that value with the Neville Werfers and the Vespa. To once you have control, if you get the control over the front line, then these can just farm value every turn with each attack because they don't receive any damage back as an artillery. Um, but of course, the risk is if you are even on board or behind, they can be really abused and punished quite quickly so it is really could be down to who starts off with 32nd infantry in their hand who starts off with the early game into the mid game um, yeah but you and... also have second california to really wrestle back control of that front line sorry to cut you off j king you go ahead i think the key card vinny's going to be looking for here is the 332nd engineers regiment which of course is the deployment gain a credit slot and two health the two health isn't going to matter a lot but it's the credit slot looking at his curve he has six one cost units and no two cost units and this is pretty abnormal for a mid-range deck he is going to be looking for this um, engineer regiment to gain the credits to curve into the fifth rangers into the california into this um we can do it and yeah if he can't find this credit he could have a much slower early game than other decks because he has cut early game for some of these sort of mid-game tech cards that could come in very powerful later with this single copy of campaign trail the single copy of bolster the ranks which if you play a turn four fifth rangers as an 8-8 you can make it into a 12-12 um, on turn five with bolster the ranks and that there's not a lot of ways to answer that <laughs> but on the other side we see dr faddist's u.s german midrange despite being the same nations he's taken it in a very different direction just looking at the curve you can see 10 one cost uh, cards four two cost cards he's got an extra greyhound in there he's got an extra dive bombing he's got the sudden strike um, it's just a much more aggressive style deck. Um, he's got an extra Blitzkrieg, I believe. Um, and it's more early game tempo with this Flam Panzer, the Sudden Strike, the Dive Bombings. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this compares into Venny's list, because if Dr. Faddist um, can sort of take the front line with these more early game cards, if that is able to give him an advantage by finding more of them, he could exploit it, because again, US front line needs the front line. And he's even going so far as to play naval bombardment to just make sure that he's able to get these draw out of these Shermans, get the value from the M7 priest. And I gotta say, it feels strange that out of the two players, it's Vinny with the fatter deck rather than Dr. Fattest. He's lower <laughs> to the ground. He he has these low curve these low curve cards. He doesn't have the same ramp that Vinny has in his deck. Amazing. Thank you for that explanation, guys. So they're both bringing these US German kind of mid range deck. One of them's a bit faster, one of them's a little bit more kind of slower, work your way into it. So what are your predictions for this one? Apologies to Vinny. Um I'm gonna have to give it to Vinny. Um, I, I think his experience, he is one of the most experienced competitive players in cards. Um, and despite his deck being a little bit slower, I think that might, um, be to his advantage if Dr. Faddist can't get an amazing start. And I think this might just not be quite enough early game to really guarantee that he gets that amazing start compared to Vinny's deck. Vinny, of so, course, does have the experience but if I were to choose a deck out of these two to take into this, I would go with Dr. Faddist's deck. Interesting. So yet again, we have a, a, a split jury here. Let's find out who wins in Vinny versus Dr. Faddist. All right, opening hand. We see Vinny does find the 32nd. 
Um, I would not be surprised if he keeps the fifth rangers or even the Neville Wofer as well. He does keep both and gets the Greyhound. Very strong opening hand uh, from Vinny. And on the other side, Dr. Faddis has the Greyhound, has the fifth rangers, but despite being the faster deck, he has the much slower hand. Yeah, and also going second in addition, which is really not what you want to see in this matchup. And Vinny has managed to find all six of his one drops by turn two. So, again, that is sort of what I meant by Dr. Fattis might have one extra one drop, one extra dive bomb in, but it doesn't really matter if Vinny finds a 30 second, because it's just going to find all of them, and that's going to be enough to bring him into... Uh, the later points of this game. However, we see Vinny doesn't have a Sherman. This could uh, become important in the future. Yeah, and the Stars and Stripes might be able to get some value in this matchup if Dr. Fattis can hold on to this very slim lead in the front line. It so, really depends how Vinny plans his development. Interesting choice um, to play out the 230 seconds and push up I would have been tempted to go for the 35T to take the value trade on the Greyhound, just trying to get as much uh, and as many two-for-one trades as you possibly can by this point, knowing sort of the uh, scope of Vinny's deck. Yeah, that certainly would have been a very reasonable to line to go for. We might see it here in the 1-2, but going face... That, I, I have to disagree with that line from Dr. Faddis, and I think um, this is where experience comes in, where... You're looking for the front line, you see control of the front line, and you just go face, but you have to think about what Vinny's going to be doing on his turn. Vinny's just going to be trading out these units, um, and suddenly Dr. Vadis has lost control of the front line, and there's an artillery in the support line that he currently does not really have a way to deal with. Yeah, the 35T was sort of the one way you had to deal with the Neville were for coming out, and this shows a bit of a difference in the understanding of the matchup where there are decks where you wouldn't trade with the one two with frontline if you're playing against more of a pure ramp you might ignore it to get the damage to face to close out the game sooner but it's really not about the damage dealt to hq in this in this specific matchup it's about controlling the frontline and eking every tiny bit of value out of it that you can and if Dr. Faddis is able to come back in this game, Flam Panzer is going to help. Um, it removes Finney's only tank, um, seeing his board and hand. Uh, or he's just going to go for the Stars and Stripes plus Dive Bombing to remove both artilleries right away. Um, that's a reasonable line. You have to be a little worried about uh, Sherman. Fortunately for him, we see Vinny does not have it in hand. However, Vinny most likely just going to push up an 8 8 5th Rangers this turn, unless he top decks Sherman. Um, <laughs> In which case, I'd like to just see a 4-4 four, four, fifth rangers and Sherman draw. Although, honestly, he doesn't need to. Like, if he pushes up an 8-8 eight, eight, fifth rangers, there's not a lot of ways he's going to lose this front line. This um, naval bombardment can come out, return it to hand. However, it can just come back to the front line as an 8-8 eight, eight on the following turn. Yeah, but still, if you're spending two credits to make Vinny spend another 8 again... It, you're still going down on value, but it is a lot of tempo, which is one of the main things Dr. Faddis needs. But it's awkward because you don't have good development at this moment in time. You can play the Sherman, get a 4-4, four, four. you can play the Flam Panzer to kill the 1-1 one, one and float two credits, neither of which are very you're very excited about. And, yep, this 8-8 5th Rangers just comes right back and... Dr. Faddist, he's got to be looking for uh, one of those three dive bombings in his deck, but unfortunately, that's not what he has right now. He can play this, we can do it, but the health gain is not going to matter on any of these units if Vinny chooses to trade. Half track's a decent draw looking forward to the future, but um, Vinny really has his choice of what he wants to do here. He can even just move up a second A date. And this is a little greedy, because if Dr. Faddis does find a dive bombing, he can just take out one of these 8-8s, the half-track can retreat the other. Um, this, unfortunately, does not have the dive bombing, but... Um, yeah, this... Sorry, go ahead. 
There's not much Dr. Fattis can do except for just play out his board and hope to find a dive bombing, but that's also very scary into Stars and Stripes just to fill your backline like that. Yeah, and I mean, from this point, Stars and Stripes is a one, a single copy card in Vinny's deck. I don't think he can reasonably be playing around it. Um, he's thinking about Sun and Strike. The health on your units doesn't really matter, but on the other hand, We've seen every single card in Vinny's deck that costs two credits or less. This is the last card in Vinny's deck that Starts and Stripes, or sorry, um, Sun Strike can actually target. So, a good play um, on that part. And he chooses to go for the trade, which is going to come in very big because otherwise the Starts and Stripes would have taken it out for free. But Vinny has just a ton of options here. He can start getting the discard going with the case yellow, drawing for himself, drawing off the Shermans. He plays instead the California just to take the front line and just put more impossible to remove threats there. And the second we can do it means that this health is now going to start to matter more. He can remove one of these fifth rangers or he can remove the second California. Um, I would have probably leaned towards, well, I think this is actually fine because you get the hit off with the Sherman. Um, you fully removed one of them, the other one's down to an 8-4. And we see Vinny's case yellow, so probably going to start coming in pretty important um, soon. And with control of the front line, Sherman's just going to find another California. There's really no way for Dr. Faddis to come back uh, from this point. Yeah, and it doesn't even really feel like the case yellows are too important. It's... The difference between playing Case Yellow and playing a Sherman is almost a little negligible if you're discarding your opponent or developing your own board instead. Yeah, and it's just a matter of time at this point before Vinny finds a oh, we can do it and these second Californias will just become unkillable. Dr. Fattis can remove this Fifth Rangers, he can remove one of these Californias. Um... Interesting, he's looking at the California trade now. Um, if you were in his position, which would you trade? If I were in his position, I'd be looking at the button in the top right, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the Stars and Stripes that's going to come out. Um, you can follow it up with Dive Bombing and a Case Yellow. Leave Dr. Faddis, no cards in hand, no cards on board, versus two Californias, a Fifth Rangers, and a Sherman with another Sherman in hand, another Case Yellow in hand, two more Shermans in hand. And, yeah, that's that's just going to be game. Another We Can Do It. It keeps him alive for a turn, possibly. <laughs> oh, jeez. Not even for a turn. This is just lethal on board for Vinny, and that is... That is game. Vinny is going to the Grand Finals. He's guaranteed for first or second. I'm sure he's just double-checking the math here. Um, but It, it doesn't <laughs> really even matter if you miss it. <laughs> yeah, if I mean, you can just go all face it. If it's not enough, you're still going to win. You can trade out and kill him next turn. You're still going to win. Um, he, he is able to, um, to camp up. In the end, he goes all face, it is lethal, and that is game. Vinny showing uh, his dominance, showing his experience in this matchup. And I believe the curse is broken, J. King. <laughs> uh, <laughs> finally, you have not predicted someone to uh, to get <laughs> to get kicked out of this uh, competition. Vinny, of course, having so much tournament experience, uh, Dr. Faddis just kind of wasn't able to build up that... Um, you know, get, get in there quickly, uh, like we talked about earlier, really kind of letting Vinny build up uh, things on his side and uh, and get that very strong lethal there, really showing the power of the fifth Rangers and the second California um, in this in this deck. So uh, as you say, Vinny, either going to be in first or second place here, he is moving on to, uh, to the potential finals. Uh, thank you, here we have the bracket. Um, 
of course, Dr. Faddis still has one more chance. He is going to be moving into the loser's bracket where we are going to see him next uh, facing off against Kraton, who beat Herbal earlier. Um, and depending on who wins that matchup, we will know who will be fighting against Vinny for the for the win. And uh, and depending on the outcome of that of that game, of course, we are in a double elimination format, which means that if Vinny then were to lose that game, there would still be another game played. Um, in order to find out who would be the ultimate winner. But um, but as I mentioned earlier, all four players, all top four players uh, get some diamonds to take home with them. So um, Herbal, of course, ending up in fourth there, getting a, little, a, a few diamonds there. Everyone is guaranteed something, a little bit of something uh, from this point. But with that, we are going to head into the final of the loser's bracket. We're going to find out who is going to make their way out of the loser's bracket. Is it going to be Kraton? Is it going to be Dr. Farest? Let's take a quick look at their decks uh, and remind ourselves what this matchup is going to look like. So, of course, here we have Dr. Faddis' uh, deck. We just saw it. It is, of course, the US German frontline mid-range deck. Uh, it's a little on the faster side, which means it's going to be slightly weaker than, say, Vinny's deck into self-damage because it is relying more on these lower health units um, that are weak to cards like Winter Warfare, cards like Bloody Sickle, like Red Dawn. We did see from Kraton that a lot of the time his sort of win condition was to get the uh, 34th guards into the front line and then do a naval supply drop on it, but this naval bombardment from Dr. Fattis' list might make that quite a bit more complicated to go for that sort of play. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it's, it's quite interesting that when we saw Kratton's decks for the first time, we were talking about um, the supply drop and the naval power, sort of these questionable cards of like, how, how good are these? Because these are not cards that are not traditionally run in self-damage. And um, ironically, those ended up being like the two cards that won him the game against Airwolf. We'll see if they work out quite as strong uh, against Dr. Faddis' deck. Yeah, and if we can go over to look at Kraton's deck, um, we still haven't seen him play a single Convoy or Lendlies, which I yeah. feel like is a really big part of why you go Britain with this deck, because you got your draw knocked out of you in the Japan Miner. Well, we haven't really... Special seen him in a position where he necessarily needed to draw like against airball he was running very low on cards but the cards in his hand just won him the game so he we haven't seen him sort of go into a longer game where he needs to draw a war to find these other cards um we also haven't seen the interception which could be uh pretty important at stopping a dive bombing or a naval bomb by when that kind of tempo swing is the type of tempo swing that can just completely turn a game on its head um and i was double checking the earlier bracket um for earlier in this tournament, and Kraton was actually knocked into the loser's bracket very early on by um, the Inquisition. So that's quite interesting. He was able to come back and get the revenge match, but it shows that he has lost to US German previously in this tournament. So um, yeah, it could happen again here. Let's find out. I mean, Birdo, do you, do you stick with your prediction? Is Kraton going to go all the way here? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, I think out of the lists he's faced so far, Airbull had the best chance of taking it from him, I believe. Um, and of course, you can start out with a worse hand, you can not find any Sickles or Winter Warfares, and just really struggle with the early game. Uh, you cannot find any 34s for that power after you deal with the board. But I think this is very good odds for Graden here. And uh, as much as I'd love to... Uh sort of take the other side. I actually have to agree with you. I think Kratton's going to take this as well. I think his deck list uh, works quite well into Dr. Faddis, and I think he's shown he's able to win these matchups, but we'll see. Maybe Dr. Faddis can get the upset and prove us all wrong. Let's find out. I just wanted to touch on uh, you, us talking about the draw before. I was kind of having the thought, like, yeah, why draw? Just just win on turn six. <laughs> <laughs> and Kraton starting first again. Um, I feel like if you self damage, you honestly more often than not prefer to go uh, second because a lot of your cards are reactive in the early game, and you want these larger hands 
to have these 34th in hand to get the discounts. I totally agree. And the start is still looking pretty good from Kratten's side with the 456 and then maybe playing the Red Dawn, but with the sudden sh the one copy of Sudden Strike from Dr. Fattest, he's just going to deal with that. And Kratten's probably going to have to play Convoy on turn 3, which is kind of slow, but still looking in a pretty alright position considering the slowness of uh, Dr. Fattest's hand as well. And I suspect we'll just see the uh, Sudden Strike come Whoa! out this turn. Or not. Um, he chooses to just go in and get the damage. Um, this is seems like an odd play to me because, uh, of course, you risk Kratten just being able to buff up this uh, 456 and get the trade with the Greyhound. In this case, he's going to go for the Red Dawn. And unfortunately, he does not have his one copy of Interception, but that might be something on Dr. Fattest's mind here, that if he goes for the Seven Strike and it's Interception, um, that could be very, very bad. Do you think Dr. Fattest was thinking of it as a bait? That the Kraton is going to use more resources into this 456 to get it bigger? Given the opportunity, if you leave it up? That is entirely possible. Um, and I, I mean, it makes sense that if you just sudden strike it immediately on turn two, it's not necessarily um, doing a lot. It's a one for one trade. And in his hand, he doesn't have any great turn three plays. So if he can play the sudden strike on turn three, which is what he did, and then he, he sort of curves into turn four, if he can bait Kratten into playing out um, like several cards from his hand to buff up this uh, 456. Unfortunately, we saw the Red Dawn hit the Greyhound, so in the end, everything traded one for one, um, and he now has another 456, as long as, along with the SU. To be fair, if Grattan had played the Convoy on turn three instead of turn four, he would have had a much more efficient line of development, and Dr. Fattest would have still had to play the Sudden Strike. It, it kind of worked out in Dr. Fattest's favor here, even though uh, to be fair, it did all go one for one, and it doesn't put Kratten in a particularly bad spot. I think it sort of played to the weakness of Dr. Fattest's hand in the situation. Yeah, and that is a huge top deck for Kratten. He can fully remove the board and then get down the SU with two 34ths. And you have the counteroffensive in hand, which you like to save Winter Warfare for counteroffensive, but you cannot turn down destroying three units and playing two 34ths for free. You can even get the SU down on the same turn. The other SU in his hand. Yeah. Uh, he could even, if he really, really wanted to, he could even play the counteroffensive on this SU to keep it alive um, in the <laughs> trade. The that seems a little, a little ambitious. <laughs> yeah. um, to... Uh, it is also fair that Kratten is likely thinking of, if you play the SU, the double 3D fourths, uh, there are two um, Stars and Stripes in Dr. Fattest's deck, which could be a little scary. And so he actually goes for the Supply Drop to keep the SU alive in the trade, and then he can get out the two 3D fourths. Maybe considering the half tracks, how um, Supply Drop on the 6-6, six, six, 34 cards might be a little less value, even if you're moving it up and playing the Supply Drop. Of course, the Naval Bombardment also able to limit that value. Yeah, and this Greyhound's going to be able to take the front line, which forces Kratten to have to respond to it before he can take the front line himself. Um, likely going to be with an SU trade, but that's not amazing because it is going to um, allow this half track to trade with it, so you'll probably have to hold the SU back. Ooh. Interception draw. We mentioned this earlier while talking about the decks. This could be a huge tempo swing card, uh, especially looking at Dr. Fattest's hand. We've seen the Sun Strike go, we've seen the Dive Bombing go. This Naval Bombardment's the only order currently in hand, so he doesn't really have any way to test Interception, or if Interception gets triggered, he doesn't really have an alternative response. And this is kind of an awkward turn for Kratten, just in terms of credits. I suppose you just trade with the Greyhand 
move up the 34th guards, um, like trade keep the SU into the Greyhound. Back. Yeah, keep the SU back and likely hold up interception uh, to stop a potential naval bombardment, dive bombing. Um, yeah, and I really don't think it's much of a tell either, because you don't really want to move this SU up for how it trades. Like, even if I don't have interception in my hand, I wouldn't move it up. I just hold intercept. Like, and with the interception, it makes it even easier. And talk to Fattis has the choice of going for the California guaranteed trade um, to remove the 34th, or he can go for naval bombardment, which if he does, that's going to leave him in an incredibly awkward position because this 34th will survive. He does not have the credits to go for the California trade after the interception. Yeah. And that is yeah. huge. He can Stars and Stripes to take out one of these SUs if he wants to, but... And it also makes you think, like, is he looking at the list saying there's one copy? I don't think it's right to play around it. Or is it a little bit of forgetfulness? I mean, I think it's really hard to say which way. Yeah, I mean, if this is um, a player's first tournament, it's very easy to, like, it's sort of take a cursory glance at the list at the beginning of the day and to get an idea of what they're playing, but not necessarily look at every individual card in the deck. Um, and here, Dr. Fattis plays the counteroffensive. It's not quite lethal yet, but this is going to be game because he's not able to remove both units in the front line. And unfortunately for Dr. Fattis, he got to the... Uh, Winner side finals, but he's going to lose two in a row. Still ends third place, which is uh, going to be plenty of gold, uh, plenty of diamonds, I believe. But unfortunately, he's not going to get that coveted first place. He's not going to get that coveted tournament win. That's going to go to either Kratten or Vinny, as Kratten is absolutely dominating the loser side bracket today and is going to make it to the grand finals to challenge Vinny. As expected, I might say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> and what an awesome run uh, by Cratton! Like, like you pointed out earlier, J King. You know, he was he was knocked into the losers bracket pretty early on, and he's been able to really chug through it, win it. You know again and again and again, prove uh, the superiority of the Soviet deck, and now. He's made it back. He's in He's in the winner's bracket, and he is going to be facing off against Vinny for the win of the first Special Operations Tournament. Um, I believe this is what Berto predicted earlier, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> now let's see if he manages to bring it the whole way home. Um, but with that, let's take a quick look at the bracket here. Um, and of course, we are at the point now where we have the final match set up we watched Vinny go up against dr fattis dr fattis getting knocked into the into the losers round there um the first two games of the game of the first two games of the day of course inquisition versus kratten kratten moving on there herbal versus henshin rider uh herbal taking the win there kratten versus herbal kratten again dominating um herbal's deck um his tournament experience uh, showing the superiority of the Soviet deck going up against Dr. Fattest, who had just been knocked out of the winner's bracket and earning his spot now in the finals against um, seasoned tournament player Vinny. Um, and I believe you said earlier, J. King, as well, that, um, that you thought Vinny was probably going to take this um, all the way to the end. So... This is a, this is a, a, a somewhat expected um, final turnout here based on what you guys said in the beginning. That's why you're here. That's why you're the experts. Um, but of course, depending on the results of this matchup, we are in a double elimination, best of one format, which means that if Vinny uh, loses here for the first time, we will end up playing the second match and we will have to go through it again to find out who is the winner um, of the special operations because uh, everyone here needs to lose twice to be totally out. So let's let's find out. Let's take a quick look at these guys deck lists before we head into the game to remind ourselves of what this matchup is going to look like. So Kratten's deck, we've seen it several times now. It is, of course, Soviet Britain self damage. And I, against Vinny, I think this card draw might finally come um, into more importance than it has uh, really been in 
previous games. And I'd like to see the 17th Rifle Regiment uh, at some point. I mean, I know it's not necessary, but it, it's in his deck. <laughs> It'd be interesting <laughs> to see that be played eventually. Um, and yeah, I, I suspect this is going to be a bit of a slower game um, than in the past. Uh, so I suspect he's going to need to use more of his deck. He's going to need to use more of these cards, more of these little combos he can use to get an edge. Um, rather than just dominate the board right at the beginning and win with the first big unit he sticks. Mm, that sounds like commentator's curse. Now I'm expecting Kraton to just win on turn five. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you never know. You never know. It, it, against Airball, I also thought it was going to go uh, a little slower, but that game did not go slowly at all. Yeah, and if we switch over to Vinny's deck, um, we'll, we'll see how these... Uh, if he's able to get a few more engineer regiments to get a little more ramp going early on. Um, but that also might be a little bit slow as well. Maybe yeah. we'll see a big campaign trail play too. You never know. <laughs> yeah, it's a double-edged sword having a slower deck like this. Because on the other hand, you're running more large units that can respond to um, Kratton's sort of... Well, large units of his own, these 34th guards, these SUs, these buffed up 456. However, it also means he's slower to respond to this. So if Kratton can get a very strong opening start, like several SUs, a couple early 34th guards, we could see Vinny's deck really struggle because it's only really able to deal with one thing at a time. However, if he gets past that sort of early game hump, it's going to get to the point where he's just slamming California into California into California. Um, and Kratten might start to struggle with that. Uh, something that I realized I forgot to mention earlier is I really, really love the one copy of Special Delivery in Vinny's deck. I think this is um, genius in building any US deck is a single copy of Special Delivery, which of course is discard all cards in your hand that cost two or less, draw two. So if you have multiple copies, they discard each other, but a single copy, it's a nice, cheaper convoy. Absolutely. We've already seen these two decks in action. We've already seen the 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 the, the, the hard hitting, the, the 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 damage that these guys can do. So it's going to be really interesting to see how they uh, fare against one another. Of course, uh, Kraton just came out of um, of beating one of these U.S. German decks, but it's quite different from Vinny's. Um, so it will be quite interesting to see. And might depend a lot on uh, on how the early game shapes up, um, whether we go into the late game and uh, and Vinny gets a little bit of an advantage there. Um, any predictions, guys? I mean, Kratten is just a, on a complete like path through the uh, Lucy's back. He's just a steamroller, blowing past everybody else. He's seven and one so far in this tournament winning six in a row. However, is this going to be a hype train or is this going to end with a massive derailment? Um, I mean, he's had to play twice as many games as Vinny. He's won six in a row. He has momentum. I suspect he will take at least one game off of Vinny. However, I think the decks are very close together. I think Vinny has the experience and he has the extra chance. I'm going to put my money on Vinny. Well, let's find out. We're into the final game. Who is going to win the first Special Operations Popper and take away the 500 diamond and 2,000 gold prize? Let's find out. This is not the Ooh. hand you want to see for Kratten. And we don't see Vinny's hand yet. Um, he passes on turn one and two, but that's normal against self-damage. Even if you have the cards to play, you'd like to hold them back just to avoid giving them um, too many targets for this early game removal. And the first card he plays is the Engineer's Regiment the milk truck that's going to give him the extra credits? And this is just worst-case scenario um, for Kratten. Yeah, all of these sort of cards that are very powerful in specific situations are coming back to bite Kratten. A lot of these cards were really crucial towards his wins early on, but if you have them at this stage in the game with no development, then you're just you're just in a really horrible spot. So you haven't given your uh, prediction yet. So uh, <laughs> looking at this, <laughs> do you still want to put it on Kratten as you've been doing so far? I'm uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Look, like you just play the sickle. 
You find 34th, you red dawn the Vespa, and, and you're back in it. It's fine. I mean, honestly, there's pointing sickle at the um, Greyhound, that's very interesting. Could be trying to set up for a Winter Warfare plus sickle, or um, a counter-offensive for a unit. He draws he is going to allow Vinny to draw with Sherman if that is something in his hand. However, if Vinny doesn't have Sherman's, it's because he has California, so the fifth rangers. It's really hard for Vinny to miss everything um, that gets an advantage for being in this situation. We can do it. Not the strongest play ever from Vinny on this turn. However, a little bit of a punish for not sickling the 1-1 the yeah. one -one in the front line. I and think was thinking about Winter Warfare after the 30 seconds come out to kill a lot more things. But not really how this is going to work out. And Convoy draws lend -Lease and the third naval power. This is rough for Kraton. Um, he's going to just naval power the Greyhound. It's going to stop a potential Sherman. And more importantly, it's going to allow him to draw a card next turn. But if Vinny just plays half-track, he Vinny might have the read that Kratten's hand is looking rough. So if he plays the half-track here, Kratten overdraws, and he's still stuck in this terrible position. I don't Vinny might just be tempted to play California push-up. Yeah, it sort of depends a little bit how much attention you paid to the lists. Oh my god, no, Kratten, please! And no! Vinny, Vinny choosing to go for another, we can do it. I'm... Not, yeah, I don't love that. I, I'm not entirely sure. These are, this is playing very, very slowly. He's playing very, very reactively, and I don't quite understand um, why. And here, Kratten needs to start playing cards um, just so he's able to draw. He's likely going to see a supply drop comes out, come out, but even if he plays Convoy here, um, it means he's going to overdraw in the following turn, so he might just naval power the greyhound again yeah, and finney is playing four californias and all three uh fifth rangers so a two six here isn't looking that impressive i kind of feel like you probably play another one and even just to and get them out of your hand so you can convoy as terrible of a situation this looks like that's only going to be a plus two plus one because the 456 yeah. actually heals itself um, I, I was going to say that it, as terrible as a situation this looks, with Winter Warfare double counter offensive in hand, Kratten is able to pull a win out of absolutely nowhere at any point. Um, this play, it does get cards out of his hand. He's moving towards being able to even lend lease, which could give him the units necessary to actually fight for Boyd. Um, but at the expense of giving up these combo pieces that could potentially let him um, pull a win out of thin air in the future. Yeah, I I really don't think Kratten realized that uh, it was only going to be plus two, plus one. A lot of players, they forget that it's only one damaged unit if one of the units on the board is 456 that just heals right up immediately after. And he finally draws a second unit, but honestly, at this point, he kind of wants his uh, orders back. <laughs> he wants these sickles, he wants these red dons. Yeah, I think that was a pretty big blunder there, going for the Winter Warfare counter-offensive play instead of the supply drop. Yeah, and California's a good answer, but if any had just had a fifth Rangers, he can play it as an 8 and just remove the unit immediately. Um, and here, I mean... There's just not a lot you can do about this uh, second California. Like, you can pin it, but then you're not really playing anything else. I guess you can do supply drop and pin it. This is fine, but the case yellow is going to come out, and these uh, 30 seconds are going to trade. Of course, if you case yellow face, um, it will buff it to 7 health. And hopefully Vinny does not make that mistake. Case yellow on the unit. You can even case yellow your own HQ for and DM. Just and just the lend lease. The lend -lease. One in six. We spoke about it <laughs> earlier today, and it it happens. The prophecy has been fulfilled. He even has the dive bombing to keep his units alive, although there's not a whole lot of value 
to keeping the units alive. I'm actually not convinced that I like the dive bomb in there because these 30 seconds still just get removed by a winter warfare. They get removed by a sickle and dive bombing can be used in the future um, for much more value. And Kratten finally plays out his units. He finally has units to play out, but it's going to be played out directly into Vinny's single copy of Stars and Stripes. And it is just all going wrong uh, for Kratten right now. The, the Vinny plot armor is just too strong. Yeah, I mean, Vinny showing the combination of tournament experience, um, lethal precision, with just, I mean, fortunate draws. That <laughs> at the end of the game, it is, it is a card game. The draw is going to come into effect. And the third counter-offensive draw, there is nothing in Kratten's deck. He's played two of his three convoys. He had his single lend -lease discarded. He only has one last convoy as draw left in the deck, and that's there's just nothing that he can draw into. Vinny has Sherman's online now. He has another California. There's the fifth Rangers. This game is just as good as over. And Vinny not dropping a single game all tournament, just going 5-0. Yeah, and I think it's worth noting that it's not even <laughs> it's not even that Vinny like drew particularly well. Kratten just drew particularly poorly. Yeah. <laughs> and that is the risk of the self damage deck is you're running a lot of these orders that are not great on their own. So you are running the risk that this can happen compared to these US mid-range lists that are very unit heavy um, and sort of have a lower power level, but uh, more consistency. And consistency at the end of the day is going to pay off in, um, in sort of these longer tournaments where it is best of one. And with that, Vinny is the first special operations uh, winner. Uh, yes. I think you're muted, Ellen. There you go. <laughs> Huge congratulations to uh, to Vinny for uh, for for that amazing show through, and of course Kraton had an incredibly impressive performance throughout this tournament. I mean, Vinny's coming here, you know, he 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 knows the drill. He's been through some tournaments, um, so for Kraton to get knocked down really early into the losers bracket, make his way the the whole way through and back into the finals is also incredibly impressive. Um, and it's always going to be tough when you have, you know, a best of one. You're only bringing one deck, so there's nothing to hide behind. You know, there, there's um, there's no room for error. Um, and and but I think that we saw some some awesome games today. Uh, some really interesting, different popper decks that show really the power of the 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 not the elites. You know, you don't always have to have to bring all of those. So. Um, with that, we have, let's take a quick look at the bracket here, how the final um, has um, shaped up. Vinny, of course, is our winner for today. He will be getting 500 diamonds and 2,000 gold. Kraton coming in second place. Um, he's leaving here with 300 diamonds and 2,000 gold. In third place, we have Dr. Fattest uh, leaving here with 200 diamonds and 2,000 gold. And in fourth, we have Erpol with 100 diamonds and 2,000 gold. So huge congratulations to all these top players. I mean, all the guys that we saw today have made their way through this. They, they, have, uh, they have put their best foot forward and put on an awesome show for all of us so it's been awesome it's been awesome sitting here and casting with you guys i'm so glad that we had your guys's expertise of course you both are tournament titans yourself you've really been through a lot of stuff and you know you build decks all the time so you know all about all the different little nuances in all these different cards so i'm so glad that we had you here to highlight those and to foresee these matchups um now before we um before we wrap things up for today, I do want to talk in general about the special operations format. This, of course, is a new format. We're doing the first one today. We're going to do some different ones throughout the year. We're going to have them uh, every three months or so. We will have a special operations tournament. Now, the popper format may come back, um, but it might not be what you see next. We will announce that in due time. Uh, and of course, we're going to be doing some more experiments with the format. Now, for this one, we had uh, a limited 32 player double elimination bracket and that's certainly something that we're going to look into for next time i know that there were a lot of uh, players who uh really wanted to play but weren't able to get in uh to this to this bracket and so certainly for the next one we will be looking into making some alterations to let as many players uh, as possible um get in and uh, and take their shot uh, and try out um, participating in these tournaments making it to the broadcast uh, and having tons of fun of course um, 
I also want to highlight, um, before we head off today, the first OCC Clash um, YouTube premiere is going to be going on next weekend. We're going to have premieres going on for all three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We will be seeing first the quarterfinals, then the semifinals, and finally the grand finals. Uh, and, and we'll be there. We'll be having a lot of fun in the chat. So stay tuned for that. We'll have that set up and we'll get you uh, some more details on that um, this week. We are so excited to see what the results are. And of course, with this new format, with this OCC split into the clash um, and the ultimate events. Um, players in this clash are going to be earning points towards making their way into the ultimate. So after we see these premieres, we're going to see how the points are going to stack up and uh, who's looking very likely to, to make it through to the ultimates. But of course, we won't know until after the three month period. So definitely make sure that you uh, that you tune in for that next weekend. It's going to be an awesome show. Um, but with that, um, I believe that we have completed our first special operations tournament. It was so amazing having you guys here today. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, any last words? Was this what you guys were expecting from this? Yeah, I have to say I was pleasantly surprised by the uh, range of decks we saw. Um, and it was very cool to see sort of these newer players trying out tournaments maybe for the first time. And I hope we see uh, them back in the future, whether it's for future special operations or they dip their toes into the standard format and try out their luck in OCC or in Open. Maybe a little bit of a jump start for some new cards to get into the OCCs as well. Yeah. But uh, thank you very much for having us, Aline. Thank you guys so much for being here. It was an absolute pleasure. We saw the power of so many, so many different kinds of decks and different cards that we don't, of course, necessarily see all the time. And of course, the new case yellow card, which uh, which proved to be very useful there uh, earlier on for Vinny. Special shout out as well to uh, to Mr. Spoos, who I believe is in the chat right now. He made a an excellent video uh, very recently highlighting the power of case yellow. So definitely make sure you uh, you check that out after this. But with that, I believe that's us wrapped up. I hope you guys all have an excellent rest of your Sundays, an excellent rest of your weekends, and uh, make sure you don't miss out next weekend for the OCC Clash event.